All right, so, hey, fantasy season started, and although, you know, we've seen some, you know, really good performances out of, like, AD, and, and you know, we got a 5x5 five five recently out of Wemby. We got Jason Tatum looking like he could be a damn MVP this season. The tougher part for fantasy managers right now, dealing with the injuries, and there's a lot of them right now, unfortunately, Dan. We got to talk about it. One of the major ones that came out, Paulo Bancaro, and obviously with Paulo, um, you know, he had that 50 point game, 37 point, uh, you know, half. It looked like he was about to go crazy, potentially 70 point game, but he hurt his oblique and even the, even hit a one second shot against the, against the bulls. That was kind of dope to see, but mm -hmm. the fantasy impact, right? Like was on a career trajectory. It looked like things were just starting to get going for him. And now we got this Orlando magic team with a couple holes here that we can potentially be looking at for fantasy purposes. As far as Paulo Bancaro goes, how are you feeling about his value? Is this a player that you just stash in your IR spot? You're not tripping about. Are you worried about his value moving forward? Talk to me a little bit about Paulo. Yeah, I mean, I feel good about Paulo just in terms of like the way that he's played this season. Like, I think the biggest growth that he's been making is, you know, the three point shooting, the efficiency. He's always going to struggle with the turnovers. Anybody that has that kind of usage is going to struggle with the turnovers. But I think we've seen some gradual improvements. So if you have Paolo in, in a categories league, I think you got to be feeling really good about the way he's been playing to date. I mean, this is a guy that wasn't anywhere close to the top 100. And now he's sitting in like, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. I think that's probably where he's going to settle in if he can continue to play on this pace, you know, once he comes back from his injury. For points leagues, though. I mean, Paolo was a top 10 player. I mean, he's number eight in fancy points per game. Obviously, that's blown up by that 50-point outing that he had damn near triple-double. Um, but I think that this is a guy that, you know, in points leagues, he's going to be a top 12 type player just because of the stat stuff. And I mean, he does everything from points, rebounds to assists. He's got the threes now, like adding in those steals into his bag. Like he's just always, always going to, he's only going to get better. Um, in the meantime, though, I think fantasy managers should probably be looking at Anthony Black young dude but he can play multiple positions they're going to be needing him and and if you keep on like listening to anything regarding the 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 Orlando Magic the beat writers the coaching they've been hyping up Anthony Black all off season Paolo too like that was the first person he was looking at when he dropped that 50 point game in overtime so um I would pick up Anthony Black sooner rather than later because I think he's just maturing if you look at his fantasy game man very versatile does the stocks can contribute in rebounds and assists won't, won't score much but does pretty much everything and then also Jonathan Isaac a guy that's uh, just gotten healthy we know what he can do at least in a permanent basis man he's always tracking to be one of the more efficient uh forwards out there because he gets so many stocks so take a look at those guys if you're if you're in a pinch it's always tough, right? Especially when you get a guy that kind of breaks out in Paolo Bancaro. Like, we've always known the name. I think the name value has been there. We know the production at least has been there. And like you mentioned, in points, points leagues has been there. But then in category leagues, it's like, it's been nice, man. Kind of like, okay, this is the type of upside that we've seen. So to lose a player like that for four to six weeks, sometimes it can be tough on you. But I think over the first two months, it's a lot of evaluation anyway. What do you really have on your team is kind of the biggest question mark. And you can see some of these other teams are missing star players now with all these injuries. So I think with Paulo, the good, the silver lining here is that when he gets back, we already know now we have a, a much higher floor than we even drafted. So I think yeah. you're going to be without him a little bit of time. You'll be able to figure things out. He'll be a blessing in disguise come January here for the fantasy teams. But I think this will give Anthony Black, who's obviously a high draft capital pick, a good chance to be evaluated here. And like you mentioned, yeah. all the offseason hype with them, if we can get him to like 30 minutes a game and he's actually getting viable floor time. And now we can start to see what kind of player is Anthony Black. This could be more than just while Paulo's out. This could be a player that earns a new type of role during this absence. So I really yeah. do like Anthony Black. And then, you know, Jonathan Isaac, I think that's kind of more of maybe your deeper league pickup, but some potential there. Do you think Jonathan, Jonathan Isaac has a chance to be like rosterable even after Paulo gets back? Or is this a short term thing? No, nah, I think this is probably more of a short-term thing. And, I mean, it's not like the Orlando Magic don't run a deep rotation anyway. Like, Isaac was going to be playing, you know, 15 to 20 minutes regardless of whether Paolo was hurt or not. They just might just give him a couple more minutes in certain matchups. Um, but Anthony Black is certainly the one you want to target. I mean, he's averaging two stocks already per game, and he's a he's tracked as a guard. Um, yeah. So you're not going to – like, that positional uh, advantage right there is, is enough for, for me to roster him. Um, and then, actually, I'd also say – Cole Anthony was their like six man for much of I'd say it's com probably a combination of him and Gary Harris, but like Anthony Black has leaped both of those guys. Like he's the first one that they're that that Jamal Let Moses is going this. to. Let me ask you this because you know it's easy to obviously to get hyped up and this is short term short term in in retrospect it's it's, it's probably going to be a short term thing, right? 
Yeah. But what's the upside here for a guy like Anthony Black? Because this team, I mean, Paulo was the team. Like when you talk about usage and when you talk about what he does for this team, it's LeBron-esque, right? Where he yeah, does so much is. with the ball and, and does so much within his opportunities that there's going to be a really big void on this team when it comes to like his scoring, even just pushing the ball, rebounding. Is Anthony Black a guy that can come in and actually have like staying power in the lineup? Or do you think this is going to be more of like a week-to-week, game-to-game type feel for him? Because it feels like there might be some additional opportunity that we're not even like counting. Like we're not like really thinking about here. Yeah. I don't know if he's given the opportunity to showcase what he can do offensively. Like I think he's been more willing to shoot, but like he hasn't had to because you know, he's oftentimes having to create and facilitate for Paolo and and Franz Wagner and others. So, I mean, I'm curious to see, like, I think most of this usage is going to go to Franz Wagner and probably Jalen Suggs. Um, But I think that that next person that beckon order is probably going to be Anthony black. He's going to be asked to do more and be given more opportunities to score offensively. So he's only he scored double figures in three of his fr- of his five games this year. I would like to see that get to like, you know, 12, 13, 14. And I mean, I think we'll definitely have staying power. Powell is going to be missing four to six weeks. There's going to be plenty of opportunity for this guy to see what he can do. Um, I just love his size at the position, man. Like he has that profile to put up like a Ben Simmons like stat line. Yeah. But like, I think there's more offensive opportunity, obviously, because he's not scared to shoot the ball like Ben Simmons clearly still is. <laughs> My boy Ben Simmons, bro. <laughs> it's a man, Kenny. It's a three on one, and he's still he's still scared of it. Like still scared. Sometimes you just lose that confidence, man. And shout out to Jalen. You mentioned Jalen Suggs. That's also another player that's probably going to see mm-hmm. a nice uptick here in production yeah. after getting the bag. After getting the bag from the he's Magic, earning they it now. Him. He's earning he it now. Earn that bag. What about Scotty Barnes, man? Obviously, Scotty Barnes dealing with an injury as well, and it's tough to see these star players go out, especially ones who. We're expecting to have like major upticks when it comes to production. Uh, but this Toronto Raptors team has heavily leaned on, you know, they, they've kind of bought into him being the future of this organization. And to see him go down, obviously, early in the season, it sounds like it could be, you know, somewhere close to three weeks, a month. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the time, the exact timetable is, but I know it's over three weeks. How are you feeling about Scotty Barnes, who we had to spend a second round draft pick right now? And he's dealing with the orbital fracture. This could be something that lasts a little bit longer because they're not going to evaluate him until after those three weeks. Yeah, I mean, he was off to a great start, man. I mean, doing what we expected him to do, stat stuff in 19 points, eight boards, six dimes, two and a half stocks. I mean, it was everything we wanted and more. But, you know, I mean, just looking at Joel Embiid, who was like the most recent person I can remember that has an orbital, you know, bone fracture in his face. Take some time, man. You're gonna have to wear the mask and all that when you come back. And if he's not getting evaluated for three weeks, like that's gonna give a lot of opportunity for Grady Dick, a guy that's coming off dropping 30 points in his last outing. He's actually playing some defense. Doesn't do much for the assists and the rebounds, but I mean, he's gonna probably be their primary score because Emmanuel quickly still out. So I think Grady Dick right now, I think he's rostered in just uh let me see. I don't think he's I don't think it's crazy yet. He's still under 30. He's 35 percent rostered right now. So if you're in a shallow league that still has him floating around, go get him Um, because he's going to be in for a ton of shot volume opportunities here. Dropped 25 two games ago. Um, The minutes are there. The scoring is there. Yeah, definitely pick up Grady Dick. He doesn't do a whole lot outside of the scoring. But shit, if you can get a guy that's going to drop damn near 20 points a game, I don't really see, you know, there's not much downside to that. that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you can just pick that up off of waivers, especially if your league mates aren't as savvy and they don't realize what's happened. You know, mm-hmm. and I talked about Grady Dick last season, and it's obviously tough for rookies to come in and make a big impact, but players who've had an offseason, players who know, okay, my time is coming, they often perform a little bit better. And we see players as they go into their second and third years start to take on different workloads and use, you know, play to their strengths a little bit. And this is a player who, out of college, we knew the scoring prowess is there. And you talked about it. This team needs a score. They need somebody because RJ Barrett, he's a good scorer, doesn't have like those 30. I don't, I wouldn't call him like a 30, 35 point guy just because mm. somebody goes down. Manuel quickly, even when he comes back, you know, he has his moments, but this team needs a an actual score. And I think Grady Dick can provide a little bit of that here over the next month. Is there anybody else on this team? Because Grady Dick is obviously he's a scoring threat. Is there anybody else on this team that you can see having some additional opportunities? Yeah, man. Um, 9% rostered. His name is Jonathan Mogbo, rookie. Um, I think this guy is the, you know, the for what Grady Dick provides in terms of scoring and shooting and three-point shooting, Mogbo does everything else. He does the rebounding. He's actually a sneaky passer, but I think it's really the stock upside that I'm like really intrigued by him. Um, this dude's gotten a stock in every game, uh, multiple stocks in, in, in several games. Um, 
he just fills up the stat sheet. And that's exactly what you want for, you know, someone in your back end depth to just fill the void for a few weeks while the star players out. This is a guy that should be rostered in well over 20% of leagues by now. And you know me, I love them defensive categories. Yep. I love when you can be efficient, at least field goal percentage wise, going to be effective. So for me, I love a defensive, sneaky defensive. You can get over mm -hmm. two blocks a game. You're getting a steal and a half a game. Like to me, that speaks volumes. And, you know, it may not be for a long time, but even over now, we've talked about this on previous episodes. This is the type of player, like, you can keep that fluid roster spot, right? Mm -hmm. He goes through a hot stretch here. You keep him on your roster, and it gets yep. closer to the time when Scotty Barnes is coming back. And maybe there's a slight different production. Now we're throwing him back to waivers. So it's not like you have to be fully invested. But if he pans out and he's getting two to three blocks a game, I don't think that's a player that can stay on waivers for any point of no. time. So. Jonathan Mogwell, somebody that's available. A player that I've liked and probably will get additional opportunity here as well, Chris Boucher. He has been a player that oh, over the God. years, don't laugh at him, over the years, he's been a Jahan type player. But the problem with him is that he's been like super inconsistent. Like I'd say the problem. The problem is he sucks. He like sucks. he's just. Man, so here we go. <laughs> no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. There's, there's always a day. There's always a damn guy who he just he always <laughs> got some hate for, bro. I, it's just the consistency, like. He's been off. He's been he's survived multiple coaching regi regimes at this point. But like, I feel like they all have the same opinions. Like, hey, we're going to give you the opportunity. We just need you to go take it and seize the moment. And he'll do it for a game. And then he'll just completely disappear. And that's what his experience is as a fantasy manager. It's like you pick him up. You pick him up after he balls out three times. It's like, yo, I got, I'm not going to fall into the trap. I'm going to go get him. Then you put him in your lineup and he's dog shit. And then you want to drop him again. So don't fall into the trap. Just go Jonathan Mogbo. And you ain't got to worry about it. But see, I, I think players like that, you, what if somebody else has him, right? So what if somebody True. else picks up Mogbo? So now you're looking, you're like, for other options, maybe your deeper leagues, you're like, you know, maybe yeah. I don't need somebody consistently, but if he has a nice stretch of games where they play four games in seven days or they play five games right. in seven days, as some of the schedules are right now, to me, he's worth at least looking at and seeing when he is playing right. Maybe you can get him on the roster. Very easy cut. But none of those guys are going to be able to, to replicate what Scotty Barnes was able to do. Is that somebody like, I don't know how you are with trading and in your leagues. Is that somebody like, do you go after players that are hurt in trades? Do you say, hmm, you know, it's not a knee. This isn't something that's like an elbow or something that can affect them long term. It's an orbital fracture, right? And maybe he's wearing a yeah. mask when he comes back, but maybe he's good to go after those three weeks. Are you aggressive in trading for people? I mean, we're going to talk about a few players here who are out for three weeks. Are you aggressive in trying to trade for players like that? Um, I'm not usually aggressive, but like, cause I, I think most of my IL spots are occupado in, in most yeah. cases, <laughs> but if they're not, like, if you happen to be in a position where you're not, you know, all your roster guys are, 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 are healthy, I would definitely be looking at the sell high opportunities on my team to go then buy low on a, a star player that can not afford maybe someone that has Scotty Barnes also has DeJounte Murray or also has Joel Embiid or Porzingis. They don't have a spot to hold them. So Take advantage of that. I would definitely be looking at the – so, like, a, a perfect example of a sell high to me is Jordan Poole. Like, he's number five in fantasy right now in category leagues. I'm not saying I would trade him. Like, I, I think that you, you're you getting exceptional value for where you drafted him, so you can ride that out. But I'm also saying, like, can you go get Scott, Scotty Barnes for, for Jordan Poole? Like, those are the things you could float out there. Package him with somebody else. Like, that may be worth it for your team. Um there's Especially quite a like few with spots, players. like because in, in most leagues, the benches are kind of thin. So right. if mm -hmm. you can package, like it's always better to create additional roster space on your bench. Yeah. If you can package that up and just tear up a little bit, right? And like mm -hmm. Jordan Poole, maybe say he's a top five guy the rest of the way, which I don't think either of us expects that. Say mm -hmm. it happens though. At least you've established a new floor when it comes to Scotty Barnes or a guy like maybe even Paulo. Um, so, but especially a guy like Scotty Barnes, who we know has top 20 potential, top 15 potential. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a hell of a move that that's, you know what I'm saying? That's the same shit I'd be doing in fantasy football. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of players that are are peaking right now that this is where if you're going to try to go get a superstar, like it's much more affordable to go get the injured guy that doesn't have, you know, a ligament injury or, a you know, some kind of like injury that's preventing you from playing basketball. Like, I, I right. like that's a great point that you're targeting someone that, hey, you got to wear a mask, you'll get used to it, you'll be fine. Um, versus like, you know, we got guys that are going out with groin injuries, reoccurring, hamstrings, reoccurring. Yep. Those are all red flags. Yeah. And another injury uh, that's kind of a red flag here, a guy that missed a little bit of time last year, CJ McComb dealing with an abductor injury. So around that midsection area, 
Uh, out at least, it sounds like two to three weeks he's going to be missing time. And this is already a New Orleans Pelican team that's down to Jonte Murray, who was, you know, came in, only got to play a game or two with the team and then ended up Cut. being out. So it sucks for this backcourt right now. And obviously, like, it, it provides additional opportunity, at least here over the next couple weeks. Uh, you know, Murray's out for an extended period of time. McCollum's out for two to three weeks. And then we got Herb Jones, who's also out as well. He'll be missing the next two to four weeks. So there's a big void on this New Orleans Pelicans team. And it's, you know, you're trying to look for names, but there's not a big, like, just, there's only one real scoring option on this team. The rest of them are, have been role players that are going to have expanded roles now. What are your thoughts overall on this Pelicans, you know, backcourt, wings? Because it's a little thin right now. It's going to be thin, and I think Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram are going to be just thirty percent usage, high volume scores for like. I mean, until someone's going to get back. I mean, Trey Murphy's still on the shelf too. Like this, 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 uh, this yeah. roster is definitely down bad right now, and so that means from a fantasy perspective, you got to find who's the next man up. And right now, it looks like uh, so Jordan Hawkins is a game time decision um, for Friday, but. You know, I'm thinking now, man, like he's got to be rostered in more than 26 percent of, of leagues. His scoring upside alone, you know, similar to Grady Dick may not give you too much more other than points and, and threes. But um, just the sheer opportunity to do play 39 minutes in the last game, like he's got to be yeah. rostered in all leagues at this point. Um, and then also, if you're in deep leagues and you, you know, you missed out on Jordan Hawkins or whoever, I think Jose Alvarado is very affordable um, now that, you know, um, McCollum's going to be missing time. Uh, he's going to be the probably the starting point guard at this point. I mean, he played 35 minutes in their last game, 16, five and four with three stocks. He's only 11% roster right now. So I think that guy's another one that like you're talking short term value, ride the wave. This guy's going to be getting 30 minutes until CJ McCollum or DeJounte Murray is ready to come back. So that's a that's a W. That's the major thing that I think enough people don't talk about is minutes like that often drives fantasy value. When we see mm -hmm. the inconsistency, a lot of times that's because a player got 29, 30 minutes one game. They got 21, 22 minutes the next game. And sometimes that drives value. And I think right now when you're down, your two starting your two starting guards, you're down a wing player. Some of these guys have to have increased roles. Jordan Hawkins has been a player that these guys have all talked up. The New Orleans Pelicans love him in his shooting ability. So to come in there and, you know, drop 23 points in a game where you're playing almost 40 minutes, like that screams to me you're going to have additional scoring opportunities. So I really love the play there. Jordan Hawkins provides the three ball as well. Probably mm -hmm. won't get you a whole lot there anywhere else. But like you mentioned, you were talking about just some of the elite scores in a game. I think at least for the next three to four weeks, we could see that out of – Jordan Hawkins. Um, and then Alvarado is one of those weird players because he kind of reminds me of like an Alex Caruso in that yeah. there's sneaky value there, but like it's sometimes you have to kind of pick your spots with him and what roster build you have. Cause he's useful. I would say in, in category leagues, he could be useful to some teams, very hurtful to others, like just depending mm -hmm. on the build that you have. So mm -hmm. I like Alvarado. Um, and, you know, I know he's gonna be sneaking up getting some steals behind people, especially exactly. Behind. You're right. Worst <laughs> case, you know, he'll get a couple steals for you. <laughs> <laughs> what about anybody else on this team? Because you talked about like Trey Murphy's out too. This Pelicans team has just been like banged up, and like DeJounte Murray's a player that I would go get. Like, I think we have another really buy low, yeah. yeah. I think he's a really good buy low, but what about any other weapons on this team? Is there anybody else on this team you like? probably has a little bit more value or maybe even a pickup than we're even giving credit for. Cause this team is full of talent and young players, especially. Yeah. I think Eve Misi is a guy that I'm, I'm really looking at and intrigued by because of just his sheer shot blocking. I mean, this dude's blocked two shots a game outside of last game uh, where he left a little bit early. Um, he's had at least two blocks a game in every game this season. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Daniel Tice start to lose minutes a little bit. I mean, he hasn't really been that great for the Pelicans. And honestly, it's the, the elephant in the room has been like, who's eventually going to come in here and replace and be an actual starting center. Cause I mean, Willie green was having Herb Jones playing starting <laughs> playing yeah. center at some point. So they're just so down bad in the front court that like someone's going to have to get boards on top of, you know, Williamson and, and, and Ingram. So I, I do like Eve Misi if you need some shot blocking, some field goal percentage, um, I think he's actually a dark horse to be, make the all rookie team just off the sheer opportunity that he has because that they have nobody in the front court.
Yeah, and it, you know, that's, I would say for the bigs, if you're talking category leagues, it's always one of the more underrated things because you'll see the strong rebounders. Mm -hmm. And we know that that correlates really well with like field goal percentage. Most of the bigs are field goal percentage and rebounds, but it's always nice when they can add the blocks. If it's a block and a half, especially if it's two, two and a half blocks. And so to get a guy like Misi who does have the blocking potential too, we talked about that with Mogbo earlier. It's like right. sometimes that upside is worth enough, especially as a rookie, if they can grow into the starting role second half of the year now you're getting a guy with like top 100 upside for the rest of the year and i think exactly. it's you know this is the time of year where you can buy low on that type of when you see when you see little elements of it i was chasing it you know the player i was chasing it with dan was uh donovan Klingon, and i was chasing it with Klingon. it's, it's a little it early it's a but... little it's a little early but there's some other guys that are getting opportunity now right that's exactly right and i think that that's what you need to be looking at so you know, obviously your team isn't what it's going to be two months from now, right? Like certain players are coming out hot. Some people are starting out slow. There's going to be some churn on the back end of your bench. But I think that's why, you know, we were talking about it this for weeks, you know, in the draft process of like keeping your bench pretty fluid because there's going to have opportunities where you're going to get somebody that might be able to boost your team for that week. Or potentially you can have somebody that can, might be a hold for like two weeks. Like I think Anthony Black is going to be is going to turn into a guy that I just picked up this morning. Uh, into a guy that I'm going to have for probably three weeks just because of the sheer opportunity. Now, it doesn't mean I need to, if he has a bad game and I see somebody else that's better, maybe I'll move on. But like, at least you're giving yourself the option, the optionality to be able to do that. This is where you're going to have to be doing some of those roster adjustments to see what works best for your team. You may not need a shot blocker. Don't look, and if we're talking points leagues, don't get Eve Misi because he doesn't score enough points to generate interest in that. But like, just understand your format and what deficiencies you might have because you can easily fill those gaps in the waiver wires right now by the the frequency of the injuries that are happening fluidity be able to adapt by any means i love that because if, <laughs> shit, if anthony black scoring 17 to 20 a game that's a whole shit, different topic now now you hold on to him topic. for until he does it yep um let's go to the hawks because the hawks have a ton of injuries as well everyone um uh, bogdan bogdanovich is out daniel hunter is out dyson daniels is out and this Hawks team, man, I know, you know, without DeJounte Murray, the expectation was like, bro, there might be some like sleepers on this team. And I think we've seen uh -huh. spurts of the Dyson Daniels. We've seen Daniil Hunter kind of step it up this year. But it's like now all these guys are hurt. We got a bunch of wings guard play that's out. And, you know, this team is not going to be a team that's competitive by any standpoint. Like this is going to be a team probably projected for another top five pick this season. Ooh, um, I think what's 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 your thoughts on this on this situation for the hawks like is there anybody you see stepping up do you think this gets better for them at any point here like talk to me how you feeling i mean i, I think it's convenient that all of their wing players seem to have gotten hurt and they drafted a wing first overall so hey man it's zachary rishishe season i guess um he played 35 minutes last game 17.6 boards at three stocks i mean i'm intrigued and if we're talking about like if deandre hunter's not coming back Immediately, he's not ready to play. Dyson Daniels isn't ready to play. He's still going through a a, a groin injury. Someone else has got to get that work besides Trey Young and, and Jalen Johnson. And I think that Risha Shea, you know, in the preseason, he had several different moments of, you know, I saw him, his potential as a creator. He's pretty good in the open floor in transition. If he gets 35 minutes a night, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, if you're looking for somebody on the wing that, that I mean, he's shown the last four games that he's able to play defensively. Like he's gotten three, at least two stocks in four, three of his last four games. Um, he's put in numbers in all the stat sheets. So like, I'd, I'd be curious to pick him up in points leagues for that reason. And if his volume consistently comes with that, you know, uh, efficiency, he could be someone that you could, you could add in category leagues too. Um, right now he's at 26% rostered. So may not be out there in, in, in 12 team competitive leagues, but um just look at the schedule it might it might pay off yeah Risha Shea it's you know it's it's with rookies it's tough because we get sometimes where they break out early and then they're over the course of the Rookie year they kind of get a little stagnant mm -hmm. and you know this team while they're hunting you know for wins obviously like this they, they want to see what what they have too like in this Trey Young Johnson and Risha Shea pairing I'm sure they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to see what their future looks like with those guys, because Daniil Hunter has been, you know, player, he hasn't been able to stay on the on the floor, unfortunately. Bogdan Bogdanovich, a veteran, we know that's a complimentary piece. And Dyson Daniels obviously had some additional opportunity. They traded for him. Uh, well, he, he was in the trade with DeJounte Murray. But, 
you start to think like maybe he does as the season goes on they do give him additional minutes even after these guys get back and maybe he works himself into a much bigger role so i don't know how long he's going to be under 25 percent roster like to me that doesn't seem yeah. right but then also like as the season goes on is this a guy that improves his play is this a guy that gets comfortable in his body and now realizes okay i am a threat here and now takes on a different role as the number one pick in the draft so i just look at this overall and i'm like you know sometimes with rookies i think it's easy to give up on them early when they don't produce or it's easy to just say they're a rookie they're going to go through growing pains but this has all the makings of like a player that could be really valuable down the stretch in my opinion for us um yeah and i think the one of the more commonly known uh you know things with the the hawks is that they've been trying to move clint capella and deandre hunter for years and this injury i mean deandre hunter was the starting small forward here you drafted the number one overall pick for a reason this is actually giving i think you, you were spot on with that it's like let's see what our future actually holds now you got the opportunity to put the number one pick into a situation where he's getting real life experience i think this actually could be a case where he plays well enough and that forces the hawks hand to be like yo we don't we'll find a place for deandre we may not be looking for the best deal out there because honestly what's deandre hunter's market anyway yeah like I think we know kind of what where he fits in as like a an NBA pro at this point. There's no like hidden upside with him. So like I think at some point it might just force the Hawks hand and be like, yo, we got a we got we drafted the right person at number one overall. Let's let him cook. Maybe they see some early results and some wins. And then it's like, okay, let's bring DeAndre back slowly while Bogey comes back. We get Dyson Daniels back in the fold, and then they look like you have a whole different team. Um yeah, I just I just never really been into DeAndre Hunter as a as a fantasy asset. He's usually just yeah. a points and threes guy. Yep. Um, and so I actually see more upside in, in seeing you know where Risha Shea can actually go now. That he's actually given the time to shine. Yeah, it's weird because like Daniel Hunter in in uh, excuse me DeAndre Hunter in in category leagues, he tends to do well like the efficiency stuff. He doesn't turn the ball over a whole lot. Yeah. Shoots good field goal free throw percentage, points and threes. So it's kind of, kind of like a player that's like an underrated player. I would say he's just not somebody you typically check for, but He's mm -hmm. probably, I mean, if he comes back and Risha Shea plays, well, he's probably going right back to the bench. He's going to the bench. Yeah, like, I mean, I don't know how you put, you can't just put the number one overall pick back on the bench, especially if you're winning too. Like, we'll yeah. see how if they, if they can create some wins. But Real quick, what about David Roddy? Obviously a player who we saw towards the end of the season last year yeah. for Memphis, play really well on the Atlanta Hawks now. I don't know that he's a anything more than a deep league guy, but is, is he somebody that you're intrigued in at all as, as far as like a deep league pickup? I mean, I like the minutes. Um, I'd probably be more interested in Larry Nance Jr. Um, just being how we've seen Anyaka Kongwu and, and Clint Capella kind of get periodic rest days and maybe it's a little injury things. But, you know, I mean, we we know how good Larry Nance is whenever he plays, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. He'll yeah. give you stocks. He can shoot threes. He rebounds well on a permanent basis. So I'd probably be more interested in Larry Nance than, than David Roddy. Roddy is – I was picking up Roddy in like a 30-deep league the other day. I was surprised to see him there. That's how like thirsty the waiver wire is over it's, there. If I'm like, oh bad, shit, we got man. David Roddy. Let's go. Like, it's bro, bad my, right now, bro. We bad. even got we even just got like random injuries to players who maybe weren't like that high on our draft board, but they're mm -hmm. you know the names that we know. Kyle Kuzma is on the shelf for a while, and then I know you saw the unfortunate uh, injury with Taylor Hendricks. Mm -hmm. Man, that was one of the more ugly injuries you're gonna see, Fire but. Yourself. Talk about a couple other players. Anybody else out there that you're just like, mm, this would be a decent pickup right now if you're searching for depth? I would say not a decent pickup. A great pickup is Bilal Koulibaly. He's 40% roster. So like shallow league people, if you're playing in, you know, eight to 10, he might still be floating out there. Pick him up immediately because whether Kyle Kuzma comes back or not, this guy is not going away. He's averaging 19 points per game, six boards, shooting really efficiently. And I, while that may not hold, um, I think that we, we're seeing kind of his game kind of like come together, coming off of the Olympic run, um, played some valuable minutes for Paris. I think his game and his skill set is just growing. He was a top 10 pick last year. And I, I think this is the point where, like, I think we're going to actually see this development of this Washington Wizards team lean into that youth movement a little bit more. We're going to see more of Alex Saar, who's another person that I think fancy managers can pick up if they're looking for stocks. And his his offensive game is is steadily growing. I don't think it's quite there yet, but. I'm intrigued enough to at least give him a shot on waivers. Um, but Bilal needs to be owned in, in like way more than 40% of leagues. Um, jazz you know side of things. That? Oh, you know, yeah. sorry about that is we, um, 
you know, I used to do a show. You remember Marcus Graves? He used to play yeah. in G League, and he mm -hmm. played against Bilal Kobali. And he said, "This is a player that's like." He was like, "Oh, I'm watching out for him when he gets into the league." It reminds me a little bit of like Jonathan Kaminga, a little bit raw when you came in. But as you start to figure out your body and your role, especially on a team like Washington, where there's opportunity. Now we see them start to put things together and maybe it's not all the way there yet, right. but like you mentioned, they, they invested a top 10 pick in him for a reason. So I love the pick up there. Anybody else you got? Yeah, I would say in, in wake of Taylor Hendricks's injury, um, probably look at, at Kyle Filipowski, uh, the Duke, the Duke uh, alumnus, um, warm, Mormon dude, really interesting situation. If y'all want to read about some shit, but um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that man was groomed for a long That's long time crazy. wild but he also happens to be a really good hooper so um just in the time that he's taken over for um for taylor Hendricks and his injury um you know he scored over 12 points per game he's getting rebounds he's he's assisting getting the threes uh haven't really seen much defensively yet but i mean again this is a utah team that has yet to win a game they're probably going to be sellers very soon john collins jordan clarkson who knows? Even Colin Sexton might be on the market at this point. He just got benched. Um, there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of change coming in Utah, and I think that this is only a signal. It's going to be like, hey, much like the Portland Trailblazers, we got some assets. Once we get them out the way, give the young boys some run. And I think Filipowski, now that Taylor Hendricks is out, he's going to be a guy that's going to, probably going to benefit in the short term. Short term. You know, it's funny when those three are on, are like they interchange a lot on the court. I watch I watch like some of the jazz games. You see like Walker Kessler, you see Larry Markkinen, and then you see Filipowski on there. And I'm like, bro, is it who's on the floor? And I think they were like 22, 24, and 23 or something like that. Like they all have like similar numbers too. And so they're all like seven feet tall. Yeah, it's like, what, like what is all this? kind of same build. <laughs> so, uh, I was I seen them rotate on the floor, and I was like, bro, who's who right now? Which one's in the game? But I think Filipowski, man, like we saw in, in college what he was able to do. So I think it's just mm -hmm. a, a minute thing and a confidence thing for him right now. Cause yeah. although he's a much different player than like Walker Kessler is or than the marketing is, he has his own role on that team. And you know, if he can get the minutes, we talked about it, the minutes are what matters for him. So I don't know. I, I don't know like what his long-term value is on his team, but as they move pieces, as they move, get rid of a John Collins, which probably seems likely. And as yeah. the season starts to wear down and they've got to see what they have out of him. I don't know. Maybe you know there was still talks that marketing might get get dealt still even after the deal. I saw he there was a there was some rumors that he might still get get. I don't nothing's know how gonna nothing's gonna surprise me with Danny Ainge, man. Like and 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 what value he can extract out of certain players. Like I think the way that these injuries are happening, we could see teams be desperate if they're you know depending on where their their status is in the league. Like they could be. I mean, we're we're out here seeing if Giannis Antetokounmpo might be a man. trade target right now. You know what I mean, like the Bucks don't look good. Damian Lillard does not look good. Wait, one and they just four don't look. Right now? They don't look happy. This the chemistry isn't there. Doc Rivers is already throwing people under the bus. Like this could. I don't know, man. We could see something just getting shook up real quick, and who knows? So I wouldn't say marketing is off the table. Like, man, the whole league is on the table. I feel like damn it. Giannis on the Giannis would be one of the craziest trades. Like after you know he signed there, they brought Dame over. They decided that Doc Rivers, who's never been the answer, was the answer. A whole lot of Darvin Ham is on the coaching staff now. Like bro, they, he Giannis was the one that co-signed Adrian Griffin being the head coach, and that dude didn't last more than what fifteen. How, games. He went thirty and ten, and he still fired his ass. Yeah, like, ah. crazy time right now in fantasy. But Dan Titus, we'll be back. Justin Henry, we'll be back to talk to you guys a little bit more fantasy hoop wise. Drop your questions or what you guys want to see on the next episode in the chat. We'll see y'all next time. Peace out. Peace.